Hi everyone, I'm Sin, Curator of Public Programs at Art Science Museum in Singapore. Thank you for joining us today for Climate Conversations with Intan Suchi Norhati. This is the second talk organized as part of Climate Conversations, a series of online talks unfolding alongside National Geographic's Planet of Plastic exhibition at Art Science Museum. This talk series dialogues with scientists and artists tackling complex environmental issues in their work bringing to you some of the most pressing, profound stories from the front lines of conservation and climate innovation. Planet of Plastic is the first show to launch at Art Science Museum since it reopened after Singapore circuit breaker. It tells the story of plastic from its invention just over a century ago to the environmental impact brought, apart, brought about by its mass consumption. Featuring 70 powerful images displayed in six thematic sections, the exhibition highlights the fragility of the natural environment and how it is impacted by the global plastic waste crisis. Each year, 9 million tons of plastic ends up in the ocean. It is estimated that it will remain there for centuries, unretrieved, destroying the delicate ecosystems critical to not just our planet's health, but our survival. This is a problem we can fix, and it is exactly what Planet of Plastic is trying to address. The exhibition not only aims to raise awareness of society's dependence on plastic by visually depicting the crisis, it also highlights innovative individuals and communities who are working on solutions to this urgent problem. We launched Climate Conversations with a talk by Cynthia Dumbia, Director of International Exhibitions at National Geographic Society who shared about how this multi-year initiative harnesses storytelling to tackle the global plastic waste crisis and effect meaningful change. And for the second talk in the series today, we are so delighted to have with us paleoclimate scientist and National Geographic explorer, Intan Sukun Norhati. Intan is senior researcher at the Research Center for Oceanography at LIPI, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Intan's research unlocks changes in the tropical climate and oceans by studying the geochemical composition of reef building corals. And today, Intan will be sharing her recent research work on monitoring plastic waste in the environment, looking at the rising tide of pandemic driven plastic waste. We're also very pleased to have Dr. Yanni Kewell, who will be in conversation with Intan for the moderated QA. Yannick is Senior Director of Programs and Explorer Development in Asia-Pacific of the National Geographic Society. And Yannick and his team nurture and grow the community of explorers in Asia, which Intan is very much a part of. So we're live streaming on both Facebook and YouTube and would love to hear from you throughout the session. So please do share your questions and thoughts in the chat boxes. We're starting shortly with Intan's talk and Yannick will be taking questions from the floor in the second part of the program. And now it's my great pleasure welcoming Intan for her talk. Hello, thank you, Shin. All right, so uh, so I I start right now. All right, there you go. Uh, so good good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for ASM for hosting. Uh, it's nice to be back virtually. Uh, but that's good. That means we uh, we can talk um, and discuss with more people and joining us today. Um, so my name is Intan. I'm a marine and climate scientist by training. Uh, but as a scientist, what I've, I'm trying to do is uh, provide and use this scientific data uh, to communicate it to communities, uh, to people, to neighbors, and also to policymakers, because these are uh, really the people who can make changes. So that's what I want to talk to you about today, uh, especially now we have a very unique situation that is the pandemic. So unless uh, we live in 1918, so this pandemic is unprecedented to most of us. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen it, first time that many people have ever seen it. Uh, it's so unique and it alters our behaviors and it's also unique in terms of how it impacts our environments because human change, then our signatures to the environments also change. And this is something that um, I'm really interested to look at. And more importantly, what can we learn? What can we change? 
Uh, so that's the kind of conversations that I want to have with you today. So we heard about this in the media a lot, about the positive impact and negative impact of the pandemic. So we, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of animals basically taking over cities because humans are not there. And this is just a form of ecological rebounds uh, momentarily. And we heard about how local pollutions, air pollutions have uh, become better. I live in Jakarta, so we have bad pollutions and uh, it did get better for a while at the beginning. Uh, and also carbon footprint, uh, our greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But I also want to show you the other side, which is mainly revolves around plastics. Um, this virus is, uh, is new to us. Uh, we try to protect ourselves. We use PPEs, uh, but unfortunately, PPEs is made of plastic. So let's combine all this information. Uh, it might sound that we have more positive impacts, right? Because we have more lists on the positive impact, but this is actually an unbalanced problem because if we put the timeline scale into our perspective, this is a different issue. What, uh, what I mean is that the lower po air pollutions, the uh, lower carbon footprint, the ecological uh, rebound, these are short-term changes. Once hopefully we beat the, the virus, we probably gonna return to the same normal. And uh, we, we, we start seeing that uh, animals, as we go outside again, animals start to hide again. Uh, but one thing about plastic is that if we put so much plastic waste today, this waste will last in, an, in, in our environment for centuries. So yes, this is not the same thing because one thing will have longer impact than the others. So let's talk about this. What does it have to do with climate? Well, if we talk about climate, um, it does seem like plastic is not such a big issue right now because uh, the main thing that really driving our climate change is uh, for from sectors like electricity, industry, changes in land use, you know, when you convert um, uh, rainforest into um, to clear up basically that will change but something about plastic it's a rising stars so this is a report from SEAL uh, basically showing that in 2019 uh, because plastics is from the byproduct of fossil fuel and it takes a lot of energy to produce even once we produce it takes a lot of energy to recycle and if we don't recycle it it kind of laid lay around in the environments and it does emit uh, greenhouse gas. So because it's so popular, it's projected that if we keep going on and on with our lifestyle uh, using plastic in 2050, uh, it might actually account 10 to 30% of our carbon budget. So it is something that right now seems unrelated, but it's something to watch out because it is, uh, it is a rising star. Now, um, we have, uh, this is a classic, uh, very famous figure uh, from also a na uh, another National Geographic, Jenna Jambeck. And it's, uh, this study really helps us to understand uh, the contributions of each country in terms of delivering plastic from land into the oceans. Well, basically where the peoples are, that's where most of the plastic are coming into the oceans. So uh, countries like Indonesia, China, Vietnam, Thailand, those are uh, up high in the rank for in terms of contributions. Of course, different study kind of uh, changed the, uh, the rank a bit. Uh, and then if you add things like, if you have barriers in, in rivers, then it does reduce your plastic emission into the oceans. Uh, but this is a very important study to map the global situations. And the number is huge um, and it's about 0.28 to 12 million tons per year of plastic waste flowing into our oceans. Um, so this is why it's such an issue that we have to tackle together. Um, everyone has to be on board. So in 2015, the United Nations set up the 17 sustainable development goals. So it's goals from poverty to gender equality to climate change to uh, something happening in our oceans uh, to make sure we are on the sustainable path. We want to enjoy this modern living, but we want to make sure 
that we keep our planet in balance. Uh, so under the SDG 14, which is life below water, um, SDG 14 one says that we need to significantly reduce marine pollutions, uh, mainly from land, including marine debris. So this is why plastics also become a uh, uh, get a lot of attention because it's a big issue, it's a big crisis, and we need to put it into this framework. Now, during uh, the pandemic, if we have any huge changes in plastic use, it's definitely gonna challenge our SDG pathway, our pathway for sustainable development, especially in hotspot area that I mentioned, like Indonesia, China, Thailand, Philippines. Uh, because, for example, Indonesia, we have recipes for having big uh, land into the ocean um, leakage. We are an archipelago country, we have high waste leakage, our coastlines are very long, uh, we have the four most populous uh, country in the world, so we have to really put a lot of seriousness into this. And the government has been putting a lot of attention into this. Now, but in the end, we have to really measure what's happening in the field, right? We can't just rely on model. Models are very useful to map the global situations, but we need to go, or oh, we are National Geographic Explorer, we have to go in the field. So this is just an example of how we want to ground truth uh, what's happening in the field uh, from our study last year. So we basically uh, monitor plastic that flows into the Jakarta area, into Jakarta Bay. This is a very highly populated area, 10 million people, uh, more than 10 million people. And we measure the, the uh, everything, waste that goes into uh, Jakarta Bay from nine river outlets. So it's shown in the red uh, circles. So there are nine river outlets, seven are in Jakarta, one is in the west in Tangerang, and one is in Bekasi. So let's see what field monitoring data shows. Well, we collect all the waste that we could collect and we separate them by plastic, metal, glass, etc. And we found out that 59% of plastic that enters Jakarta Bay is actually plastic. So that's a lot of percentage. Basically, half of it is plastic. Um, and what's more interesting is that you can't just treat all plastic all equal because we found a lot of styrofoam. It's sty styrofoam is the most popular Plastic, plastic waste that we found. This is because styrofoam has no value to uh, waste pickers. For example, uh, we, uh, plastic bottles, uh, when we throw it away, when it, don't, it doesn't get recycled, it will get picked up by waste collectors because it has value. By styrofoams, uh, once, it, once we use it, it goes into the environment, that's it. No one's gonna pick it up until, unless we have strong political power to do it. What it will, I mean. So another thing is timing matters. So this is very logical that during a uh, high rainfall period, during rainy seasons, we found that there are more plastic going into uh, the oceans, which means that if we want to intervene the plastic waste, we have to put a lot more efforts during uh, rainy seasons. And now we are uh, climate wise, we are experiencing more than uh, basically more rainfall during uh, because of La Nina. So this is something that we need to watch out. And we found that as much as eight tons of plastic flowing into Jakarta Bay daily. Now this sounds, my, this sounds a lot, it is a lot, but it's actually a lot lower than model-based estimates. It's eight to 16 times lower. So what it means is it's good to have a global view but we have to check it in the field because a lot of interventions matters. And we also found that Jakarta, because maybe because it's a capital city, it's a bit more high maintenance. Uh, we take a lot of plastic more from our river compared to our neighbors. So I have seven uh, sampling station in this study. Even if I combine all those seven, it doesn't compare with what's happen happening in the neighborhood uh, Tangerang and Bakasi on the west and east of Jakarta. So this really put uh, the emphasis that local action really matters. So with this simple study, this is basically study that 
everyone can replicate. This is a sort of a citizen scientist kind of study, but we can inform policymaker, we can inform uh, the government, the governors of Jakarta, basically what to reduce, not just plastic, but styrofoam, those that doesn't have value. When to reduce, put more effort during rainy seasons, right? And the importance of ground truth data, because you can't just rely on model data once you talk local context. And the last thing, which is more important, the most important, that local action matters. Any intervention that you put, yes, it will reflect in the environment. Now we have a new beast. Uh, we have a new normal. And I keep the same question, what to reduce, when to reduce, and how during the new normal. Now we have an interesting uh, situation now. Before the pandemic happened, we all were out and about, you know, we work in the office, go to the mall, I haven't been to the mall since January. Um, but basically our ways are everywhere. But now that we are working from home, uh, our ways are concentrated, including our plastic waste in a uh, residential area. So this include PPE, but also because during the pandemic, we rely more on e-commerce, you know, package delivery, uh, and this thing have extra stuff. It has bubble wrap, it has more packaging stuff that are uh, made of plastic. Now we have another issue that we might just increase our plastic waste imprint because we are doing everything from home and relying on e-commerce. So when the pandemic start, the quarantine start in Jakarta, I, I couldn't go out, but I'm really curious about this issue. Uh, so my friends and I got together, let's do an online survey, right? People can do this from their home and we can understand what's happening in their household, how's their plastic waste. So we did it nationally, but mainly the concentrations in, in Jaffa because uh, we want to hit places that have high uh, COVID cases, because when you have high COVID uh, cases, you are more quarantined in that region. Uh, we also look at uh, places that have e-commerce market. So 75% in Indonesia, especially in Jakarta area, uh, and also places that have lockdown situations. So this, uh, the figure, the map basically showing where the COVID cases are, mainly in Java, but South Sulawesi, for example, somehow has very high cases in comparison, and West Jaffa is actually one of the provinces that start quarantine early. Now we ask our correspondents, basically, uh, when you receive package, how many of, how, what's the percentage of them that have plastic packaging? Of course, it's very high. It's 96 in Jakarta, it's 98 in other places in Indonesia. So by just automatically, when you buy something, you have extra plastic. Uh, mainly packaging tape, uh, plastic seats, and bubble wraps. Those are the three most common, uh, most popular plastic packaging that we receive today. But I want to highlight though, this some of this packaging stuff may be reusable. I like to reuse bubble wraps for going into the field, for example, but they are not recyclable. Like I said, all not all plastic are equal. If this was water bottle, we can recycle it. But how do you recycle cable ties, for example, right? So this really put into this perspective, what do we need and how can we stop this? All right, this is a busy figure, uh, but basically it's a consumer behavior figure. Uh, in the left is for Jakarta area, in the right is outside Jakarta. What I found is that urban area like Jakarta has greater e-commerce activity and also increase in activity. So during the lockdown, uh, 62 more people, 60% of my respondents engage more in e-commerce. Uh, 47 people engage more in ready meal delivery. But this is very unique to Jakarta. This doesn't happen outside Jakarta. And so we engage more and we also buy more frequently. So this just show you that, yes, there's an, a good uh, indication with data that the e-commerce are increasing. And what do people buy? Mainly foods and disinfectant. <laughs> pandemic, right? Uh, so before the pandemic, maybe people just buy ready meals, but now we start branching out into uh, noodles and vegetables and meat. 
wet foods. Uh, so disinfectant, medicines, and PPE also increase. But one item that increased the most is PPEs from slightly less than 5% of the respondents to 35%. It's the highest rocket, skyrocketing item that people buy. Okay, that's fine, it's consumer behavior. But the problem is it shows in the environment. So while we were on lockdown, uh, thankfully my colleague have people that uh, live near the river outlets. So he asked uh, these people, uh, but we couldn't repeat this. We actually, we won't repeat our study, our previous study, monitoring river uh, debris into Jakarta Bay. But we couldn't do it in nine sites. We only could do it in two sites. But what it tells us that before the pandemic, we couldn't really find PPE. But during the pandemic, 15 to 16% of waste that we found are PPE. 15% to 16%, that's a lot. So what happened in your house get reflected into the environment. Um, and this is very consistent also with data that we found from the, uh, the landfill. So landfill uh, people report that while waste in general reduced during the pandemic, during the lockdown, but uh, there are more plastic in, the, in terms of the compositions. So this is indeed what we see also in the rivers. Now, there is this argument um, that we use plastics because we are concerned with our public health, with uh, our exposures uh, to uh, COVID-19. But when we ask our respondents, actually 60%, more than 50%, says that plastic do not reduce the exposure to COVID-19. When we receive package, we do many treatments. We, we spray them, we disinfect them, uh, we put them in the sun. Uh, very few people would open it right away. And this is very sensible because uh, COVID-19, the virus, can stay in the surface of plastic uh, three days, sometimes up to nine days. So you have to wipe it, you have to dis disinfect it. But then considering that a lot of items today are already sold in plastic, do we really need an extra plastic to wipe them up? That's another que uh, question. Where, where we, do we put the line to, to have more plastic? And we also ask uh, people, how aware, how concerned are you? Uh, when we ask who is the most responsible in managing plastic waste, 51%, half the people say, I am, instead of the local, uh, you know, the local manage waste management. That's a lot of, that's a high awareness, right? And we ask, is it important to sort plastic waste? 98% says, yes, it is important. But when we ask, do you sort, sort your plastic waste? It's only half. So it's like half of the room left, you know, when we ask, do you do the action? And during the pandemic, also we found that people recycle less, reuse less, and just throw plastic right away. So we have to stop, reflect. This is a long pandemic. We got to do something about it. And this is also the reason why we actually, I talk about this to the media uh, with a lot of people really before we publish the data, because I don't want to wait until, you know, the publication, it takes a long time uh, while we as society uh, don't reflect on this and change our behavior. So yes, uh, it's a long pandemic. We need a, not just a new normal, we need a sustainable new normal because we need to balance the environment and economy. We might be running into a recession, that's the thing. And the e-commerce sectors actually have, uh, can help uh, recession a lot. So we need e-commerce, but we need to do this more uh, sustainably. Um, and this story that I'm telling you is from Jakarta, but I'm sure it resonates in many people, uh, places in the world, especially in urban area. Uh, and basically, okay, it's a big issue, but when we kind of think about the solution, it can be very small little steps, but once you do it a lot, it accumulates. So uh, here are just some tips uh, to be environmentally conscious when you do online shopping. Uh, if you can, support 
sellers as much as possible sellers that uh, sell products without plastic packaging. They're very rare. So if they exist, please support them because it takes, uh, you know, they have some time to increase the price to do this. And because there are not many of them, we have to be proactive. Ask, please reduce the plastic as much as possible. If the products are not fragile, don't put bubble wrap, right? Uh, and if we buy item in bulk, then we can reduce the uh, numbers of plastic. Um, and definitely reuse. If once you disinfected it, we can always reuse. Uh, I love reusing bubble wrap for field work, for example, for my samples. Uh, and start sorting our plastic. We need to remind ourselves, remind our family about this. Uh, and if we buy items for from nearby locations, it may not be very uh, relatable in Singapore, perhaps. But for example, in Indonesia, we can get items from many places. But if we if I buy item uh, closer to home, that means I can help reduce the greenhouse gas. So we definitely need to transform our awareness, which is already very high, is great, thanks to the media, thanks to everyone, but we really need actions right now. Um, because right now, yes, there's about 20% of people that have initiative to request less plastic, and we need to, uh, we need more people to do this. Now, a few years ago, I think, uh, or last year, uh, National Geographic has discovered about plastic being an iceberg issue. What we see right now is just an iceberg of a bigger issue of plastic. But for me as a climate and marine scientist, this figures tells me that plastic is just an issue that people see right now because it's so foreign. We don't have plastic in our body, right? We're not made of plastic. Uh, but there's so many marine and ocean issues that we can tackle as well. Uh, the nutrient access, marine pollution, harmful algal bloom is a big issue in Singapore. And on the climate side, uh, we have ocean acidification, marine heat wave, the oxygenation. Not to be uh, pessimistic about it, but please realize that all of this is because actions of one times many people. So if we as an individual, one person can change that and be good uh, virus during this pandemic, I think we have really big hope on solving and become a more sustainable community. So that's from me. Uh, I will end my talk in there. If I was an explorer. If I was an explorer. I would wake up. Put on my gear. Put on my hijab. Binoculars. A hat. I would take my tools to investigate i put on my spacesuit and then i shoot off into the stars if i was an explorer i'd climb into a rocket i'd fly to the sun i like to go to the places that most people usually don't go to explore my city i'd tell stories to the world with my photos and videos of my experiences and my discoveries I'd go to the depths of space, the bottom of an ocean. If I was an explorer, I wouldn't care about getting dirty. I would discover and analyze different things that have never been seen before. I will discover new species. I would take my findings back to the lab to build things, create new things. I'd find a cure for cancer. I'd recycle our trash to build buildings. I'd make the world a better place. Maybe an explorer is all about understanding this world better. To show the world a different way of seeing. To venture into uncharted territory. My name is Arthur Huang. My name is Hannah Reyes Morales. My name is Dominique de Mil Correa Gonzalez. And this, this is what an explorer looks like. Um, yeah, good afternoon and thanks everyone for this um, fantastic presentation. Um, so for those that have um, just joined um, maybe a little bit later, um, my name is Jan Kuhl and I'm the Senior Director Asia Pacific of the National Geographic Society and I'm based in Hong Kong. 
So for those that do not know, the National Geographic Society uses the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonders of our world. We were funded in 1888 in Washington, D.C. So for now 132 years, the National Geographic Society has driven impact by identifying and investing in an international community of explorers. These are leading scientists, educators, storytellers, conservationists, technologists, and many other change makers who help us define some of the critical challenges of our time, drive new knowledge, advance new solutions, and inspire trans positive transformative change. Since awarding our first grant in 1890, we've provided more than 14,000 grants for work across all seven continents. If you are interested in our grant opportunities, please visit our website, um, www.nationalgeographic.org, um, or contact me um, to find out more. Um, around Asia, we have a strong and growing community of explorers um, that work on pressing issues. This community includes, for example, Hannah Reyes Morales, an award-winning photojournalist, and Cabras from the Philippines researchers Beatles, and had just been selected as one of our 2020 early career leaders. Um, or Amant Miharis, who recently discovered um, the Homo lucinesis, a new human species. And of course, Intan, who does not um, need an introduction for um, for this um, afternoon. So Intan, again, thank you very much for um, this very timely research um, and to demonstrate that um, plastic is a cross-cutting issue and that actions today will impact um, future generations um, and ecosystems and also for emphasizing the importance of local data and, and context that are so, so important um, in, in, in finding solutions and showing that local actions um, really matter. But I guess before we dive a little bit deeper and, and also go to, to some of the audience questions this afternoon, in one, um, maybe can you talk a little bit about um, the kind of work that you're not doing when you're not working on plastic? Because I know that you're a woman of many traits and you have, um, you know, you're, you're usually very busy flying around the world, going to different meetings. So um, maybe talk a little bit about um, the type of work that you're involved in when you're not working um, on plastics? When I'm not working on plastics. Thank you, Yannick. Um, so, yeah, I by training, I started my career as climate scientist. Um, you probably heard right now that we are experiencing this thing called La Nina uh, in the Pacific. Uh, it's part of the climate variability. And I, I, when I was a kid, when um, I experienced La Nina and El Nino, and I was very curious about it. So then I pursue my study as climate scientist. Um, and like I said, it's not just about, uh, you know, writing good papers for my career, but really talking to people. So Nat, Nat Geo has been very influential uh, basically also teaching me how to do science communications better. Uh, uh, I think the Nat, Nat Geo Explorer community is very good at that. Um, but also I'm involved in the upcoming uh, UN IPCC. So the UN uh, basically updates our report our, uh, on climate change from this, uh, the state of climate change and how we can adapt, how we can reduce our carbon footprint. So basically it's a many climate scientists working pro bono so that this is not just uh, a big paper for climate scientists, but also for policymakers. What can they do to reduce and to adapt to climate change? So yeah, I think um, that I think that's the great thing about scientists and just having the talking to different people, uh, not just from the science community, but also talk to policymakers and really how we can make our research impactful, even though like what I show you today, it's a very simple uh, research in a way, right? It's a citizen scientist work that we can do. And that's exactly my point. Uh, we, you can actually generate this data, even if you don't work for like research institute. So I think I wanna infect that <laughs> virus to people, like you can be part of it in science, in generating data and also in actions. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, you raised a really good point. So for um, for the National Geographic Society, citizen science actually is a fantastic tool that allows um, everyone to become part of the solution, it, be it um, in biodiversity observation or be it in, in issues that you're mentioning related to plastics, um, to, to track and to make observations, even in your own backyard, even in times when 
um, social distancing is in place and then when you're not supposed to be in groups. So I would like to encourage everyone to, to, to look at um, citizen science as something um, where, where you can really become an active um, part of the solution. And, and just, just staying on, on, on the issue of, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's remarkable how quickly you, you have adapted and how your curiosity um, has been sparked given that Corona is in our life since, since March. And here we're talking about um, survey results and, and, and findings from a study, which is, um, which is impressive. And, and, you know, I know that your life is normally very hectic, um, very busy. Um, I know that you know, one of the highlights of, of, of your work is, you know, talking to, to policymakers, I guess, but it's also being in the water and diving and, and doing field research. So, so how has 2020 been so far? Uh, so we still can go in, uh, to the field work uh, because I think in Indonesia you have to fly. So uh, I think our office policy is that if you can drive to the site, go ahead. <laughs> but if you have to take public transport, then you can't do that yet. Uh, but so yeah, so this is also this research was based on also frustration because you know I was home lock and uh, well it's actually interesting. It was actually not geo that. A spark on this because early on during the pandemic, at, do you remember like we had this session um, on our leadership coach and how you can cope with crisis? And one, I was pretty down at that point, honestly. I'm like, what's happening with the world? And then, but I remember she said that every crisis has opportunity. At that point, I I was like, okay, I, I just keep in keep it in mind, but I didn't really have any uh, real you know real work to do, like what real ideas. And this just come up like, okay, this this is crisis and uh, there's an opportunity and I can still doing research at the comfort of my home and still get good data. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's really great that you were able to channel, I guess, that that energy and curiosity, um, this, um, this Im important um, research. But um, let's maybe jump to the to the questions um, from, from the audience. So we have one question being asked, um, what is being done to stop waste dumping into the ocean? Um, because it's recognized that it's one of one of the interventions to stop plastic entering into nature, um, other than circular economy. So, so stopping the waste going into the ocean. What's being done, and I guess in particular in Indonesia? Yes. So uh, I think you have to have strong political will. It's some, something that uh, community and also being uh, incentivized by government. And Janet Jambok papers actually excellent in poking at that. Uh, because of that paper, many countries, many government really tried to do their best. Uh, well, I can talk uh, for Indonesia, for example, because of that paper, uh, there uh, we tried to reduce plastic by 70% uh, in five years from now, or it was eight years from it was started. And hopefully in 2040, we can be plastic free. That's an ambitious goal, but that was because of scientific data that pushed this. So that's great. And I know this is not just Indonesia. When I talk to um, scientists from Thailand, they also have the same situations. Now, how do we do that? So for example, what is Indonesia doing is trying to tackle from many areas. One is awareness. We have to educate people. But like I, I've shown you today, in terms of awareness is mission accomplished, right? We need real action to reduce. Now, uh, because Indonesia is an archipelago country, when then we have to intervene from land-derived plastic source as well as uh, island-derived. Right? This has to be intervened. And this involves uh, from industry at the top to consumer behavior uh, to how we recycle plastic. And there are many ways uh, to, do, to, do, to do this creatively. For example, I talk about e-commerce today. But I only talk about how e-commerce deliver plastic into your homes, right? But uh, actually, e-commerce applications start doing this great initiative where you can, they actually pick up your plastic waste and they bring it back into um, manufacture. So it's part of the circular economy. So yeah, why not? You know, it, it was sort of our, uh, you know, it was negative thing, and but you, you turn lemon into lemonade, right? I think that's great. We need more of this kind of initiative. Uh, so what happens if you can't recycle the plastic? There are so many of them, right? Right, Like cable ties, <laughs> how do you recycle those? Uh, so in those kind of situations, we convert them into energy or, or use it as uh, an asphalt for rope. 
So we recognize though, when we convert into energy, we're not making money. It's actually not economically uh, profitable, but this is the best we can do to convert, to get rid of plastics. Uh, when we convert it into road, it actually makes a more durable road. And I know many people have um, a lot of ideas, you know, making it into construction of materials and stuff like that. So, yeah, so, and also R&D. R&D is important that we, we need to provide the data because when you say the government want to reduce, what data are they using? So we need to keep them also in check. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as, as, as you demonstrated, the, the local data, is, I mean, that's that's quite a significant mm -hmm. difference that, that you've, yeah. you know, that the local data has shown compared to the um, to the international data. And um, one question that I had when, when you, you showed the the difference in terms of willingness or or knowing the importance to to um, to recycle plastic and then actually the action when you sort of said that half of the people left the room. Um, how convenient is it in an urban setting in Jakarta to, to to recycle? Because for me here in Hong Kong where I live, it's super convenient. I live in a compound and downstairs um, there's you know there's there's five different garbage boxes where I just have to separate my waste. It's, that doesn't make any effort, so it's easy for us to, to, to recycle. But how is the normal setting in Jakarta? So that I think convenience is, um, we're all lazy, so convenience is always um, one factor that, that, that plays into that. Well, lucky you. <laughs> we, uh, we still don't have very good recycling, uh, recycling system. And I know, uh, especially people who live abroad, like in the US and Hong Kong, in developed countries, that have very good recycle and I'm in the habit of recycle when, when I was living abroad when uh, in Indonesia it's like even with willingness to recycle like even if once I sorted my plastic I have to make sure is it really getting picked up you know but uh, one thing with Indonesia though we uh, and many developing countries there's a lot of waste pickers right even if uh, yeah they got uh, compiled into big truck uh, they got dumped into landfill uh, it'll get picked up, especially if they're valuable. So they get picked up eventually, but the process is messier, right? Then, uh, yeah, I, I know like Hong Kong, Korea is really good with recycling. It was so hard to find plastic bags and stuff. Um, so, so we have to come up with creative ideas. So what I mentioned earlier, uh, maybe in places where there's not many a strong e-commerce activity, uh, it will be hard to do, you know, this program where you can have your waste picked up. But for Indonesia from Jakarta, that's that's actually a very smart solution. So you have to really look at your community and what's what works best for you. Okay. And and, and related to this, there's a question from the audience. So someone um, is, is asking saying that some plastics are labeled as recyclable. And um, how effective is that? I, I guess we've touched upon this a little bit already. And and I guess what's the difference between can you say a little bit what what differentiates non recycle and recyclable plastics? You've talked a little bit about bubble wrap and 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 bottles. Can you go a bit more into depth around that? Yeah, uh, it goes back to also this concept of circular economy, right? If we uh, it's like mimicking the nature. Ma the nature has this circular economy. Uh, there is no waste in nature. Even waste get converted into nutrients. So that's what uh, this whole circular economy and recycle management uh, try to do. So you label your, um, so very responsible manufacturer will actually have a better quality or plastic that are well labeled so they can recycle it, they can pick it up. But before they can pick it up, they need to have it uh, put together, right? Uh, like you said, like in Hong Kong, it's easier. In Indonesia, it will uh, involve, um, waste picker. So if it's recyclable, yes, technically, manufacturer would love to recycle those. But uh, it's also about the context of your community, how they get transported back into the hands of manufacturer. Okay. All right. Um, th I, there's another question from, from the audience, which um, I'm, um, you know, uh, I guess it relates to something we've talked a little bit before is that um, some people in, in Singapore don't recycle because Singapore burns waste for, for land um, land reclamation. And um, that person is asking if this is a long-term solution um, to the, to the, to the um, plastic problem or not. 
Well, Singapore has this island called Semakau Island uh, that it used as landfill. But even the landfill in Singapore, Indonesia is very different though, because Singapore is very good about, um, you know, they, they know they have such limited uh, space. They even have to make islands to as landfill. So the amount of, that goes into landfill is already intervened a lot. So if only if you can dump it, then you dump it. But if you can recycle it, you recycle it. Right? Uh, Singapore is really good in that. I mean, uh, it is it's Singapore. Um, where we talk about landfill in Indonesia, we talk about huge, huge landfill. It could be one of the biggest in the world. Uh, because we, actually, I didn't show it uh, in the slide, but one of the findings that we found in Indonesia, mostly 80%, 90% of the uh, respondents' uh, waste goes into landfill. So we just dump it. Uh, if people work in rural area where they have more land, we would bury uh, our waste. But in Jakarta, I see show that less people bury their waste. Uh, but yeah, in for Singapore, I think Singapore is just very efficient in many ways. You know, in water we are uh, used in uh, in waste management. Um, but of course, no no country is perfect. But I would be very grateful if uh, that system is already in place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess no, no surprise there. Um, and we we have another um, another question that was is is was wondering if your research also really um, asked respondents about plastics management, um, and 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 you know, and, and that person wonders if the economic dimension of plastic is is actually the biggest issue that we need to tackle to to navigate its consumption. And I guess that that goes into sort of taxation issues, externalities, and, 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 and all of those. So what's your, what's your take on that? Um, they, I, for, for Indonesia, but I'm sure it's done in uh, other countries, for example, one of the ways is actually the Ministry of Finance tax plastic more, you know, those could be solutions. So it has to be uh, everyone concerted effort. Uh, tax definitely work. If you have to pay more, of course, you will, <laughs> you will not buy it, right? Um, incentivize uh, also see that i mean this i think what i see right now is really uh i've seen a lot of manufacturer tech also trying to solve this issue uh i can't speak from their behalf whether how much they get incentive or, or not doing that but i think they really want to uh you know sustainably exist as well they want to be in the market but they want uh they want to be responsible they try to make the products for example uh one of uh, a major uh water bottle company in Indonesia, you know, usually when you have a bottle, right, water bottle, and then you have this label. Well, the bottles are recyclable, but the labels are not. So one of the simple things that you can do is remove those labels, right? You just kind of uh, dent it into the uh, the bottle itself, what the product is. So I think that's very smart. Uh, that's, uh, that I really appreciate that kind of um, move from, manu uh, from the industry. Did I answer yeah. the question? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think you did because I think that's 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 you know these are um, good examples and I think you know it's it's um, yeah it's it's at the end of the day it's really um, you know about the, the 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 costs that are that are associated to this and I think that you know a lot of companies at the moment are on the one hand um, you know motivated about the sustainability of of, of their products and operations um, but I also think that. Um, you know, plastic, single use plastic just isn't cool at the moment. Reducing plastic isn't cool? No, say using single use plastic for companies. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's that's just as, as a sort of marketing tool, it's also important to 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 show um that, that you're doing something. And yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think being green uh is also it's a it's a marketing uh thing, right? For for a lot of companies because you see like there's such a huge awareness of so people, consumers really want to pick it up, really want to support this. So if you um, start a company that's very environmental friendly in the ecosystem that is still uh, very rare to do, that's a good business, you know, uh, way to start business, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we have two more questions from the audience that are more yeah. um, related to, to, I guess, what we can do. Um, and one question is, I guess we we all have these uncles, loved ones um, that are maybe not as much aware with and, and um, responsible with their actions. So, 
What are um, what are kind of actions, and how can we encourage um, other loved ones to be aware of use reusables without um, appearing like we're being too extreme and trying to um, emphasize or, or support a, a green and more sustainable lifestyle? Yeah, well, a lot of people are very concerned with the plastic, but we should not deny that many people do not care. Uh, but I say my undergrad was in economics and I know money talks, right? When there's money, people have more incentive. So I think one of the uh, really nice initiative that's going on right now is, uh, for example, like uh, what was called waste bank. So you basically you make money out of your waste. So if you, uh, I'm sure in your community that there are those pockets of initiative. And uh, especially, let's say if you have uh, relatives who are, you know, uh, not in their productive years. Um, and this is, could be something that is easily done at home. Like, it's, you know, it costs you nothing. Uh, you produce plastic and you can make money out of it. So I think incentivizing people with uh, monetary, uh, um, you know, things that they can uh, get in, in terms of monetary, that would be one thing. Uh, not to mention, I'm not to say that we should, that that is our focus. But we, we have to like deeply really understand how important it is to protect the planet. But you have to be infectious to other people, starting understanding what do they need. If 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 money talks, then money talks. Use use that strategy. And then eventually they'll I mean this kind of things can be uh addictive sometimes. You know, you start uh doing stuff and then, oh this is fun. Uh, I still do more. You know, some people right now not just focusing on plastic. Actually a lot of my colleagues start uh managing their organic waste at home, turning it into something else. Uh, I could see this being a very addictive thing to do, especially during the pandemic. And do do in fact those people with ideas. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's great. I think um, one, one of the examples, or one of the ways to con convince people is obviously um, leading by example. So, um, and one of the questions from the audience is, so what are the practices that you do um, in your daily life that um, you do to um, mitigate climate change and reduce plastic. So what can others learn from you? Yeah, uh, well, every people have different habits. And I think for me, it was just, okay, in my business as usual, I do nothing. Uh, this is what happened. For example, I, I used to love, for example, you know, bubble tea, coffee. Uh, and a lot of times then I would produce plastic waste. Uh, even and then for me, it's, it's a small step, for example, but I know it's something that I do every day is my how I make coffee. You know, I used to buy, you know, like in Jakarta, it's really during days like this, it's hot, it's so nice to have iced coffee and just order it online. But then I felt so guilty of the plastic that I was making, and I actually start growing my coffee. Uh, so by growing coffee, I mean, I make uh, this is from three to cup. Uh, and it, I, I told you, it becomes a habit. I didn't really, it was, I started small and then it was becoming a addictive thing to do. So I thought, well, now I don't produce uh, waste anymore by drink, drinking coffee. And I also, because I grow my own coffee, then uh, there is a zero, probably negative carbon coffee now. But you do that every day, it, it pops up. And I know uh, my colleagues also use solar panel and stuff like that. There, there are many ways. Uh, I think the important thing is that you know your habit and you are the only one who can change it and you know where to hit it. Yeah, ab absolutely. I hope that one day when, when we have the opportunity to meet in Jakarta, then again, you invite me for, for a coffee that you grow, <laughs> that you grow yourself. Um, and, um, and I think, as you said, it's so, so important that, um, you know, we need to do things that, that um, that small small steps make such a difference because you know a lot of small steps add up to quite a lot and 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 that's really um, really important. Um, I'd like to um, we're almost at the end. There there is um, one one set of question that relates to citizen science. So um, what are because you know for for citizen science is such an exciting tool for, for for many scientific questions and challenges of our time. So what are some of the citizen science approaches related to climate change? um that um we can work on so do, do you know any um 
I think with, with climate change, then it goes into mitigation, uh, how to re reduce uh, CO2. Um, and usually what I've seen is, is an initiative by young people, but they would form as an NGO to make it more organized. And these are very young people. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, these organizations, not just in climate change and also in plastic issues. But for climate change, for example, is, uh, you know how a lot of people actually f also feel guilty, but uh, maybe like fly before the pandemic, flying a lot and uh, driving a lot, and they really want to pay up. They really want to uh, give it back to the environment. And if you have society where people can channel uh, their resources so that you can plant trees, uh, conserve mangroves, conserve uh, seagrass, those actually seagrass and mangroves can take CO2 back into uh, another medium, right? So I, I really appreciate those. I mean, coming from very, very young people and just get together and, uh, and it's also could be profitable as well. So they help the environments and uh, they help uh, people who want to contribute but couldn't find a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, from, from um, just if, if I may add, I know there's the, the Marine Debris Tracker, which is um, um, a citizen science tool that um, people from all around the world can um, can contribute. So so if anyone's interested, um, there will be opportunities to to um, to contribute in, in, in your um, in your locale. And I think the final question is, and, and you've touched upon this in your presentation already, you've shown the slides in terms of emissions and how plastics relate to emissions and how, how everything is, is interconnected. But do you have um, sort of any final words on how um, the learnings from the fight against plastics are applicable to fight climate change? How, how is this um, connected? And um, are we making um, progress towards um, both fight, fighting climate change and plastics pollution? I think uh, my take home from this is not just plastic and climate change, but crisis in general, right? Uh, I'm actually learning a lot from the pandemic, from the virus. Uh, we are facing uh, plastic crisis, climate crisis, and health crisis. But the health crisis really taught people that early action saved people's life. That if you procrastinate, the cost is much higher. And that's something that we've done with climate change, to be honest. We know climate change since 1970s, but you know, political will was so hard to mobilize uh, and we are paying the price. Uh, so right now, for example, marine heat waves happening in all, uh, it's already happened in all oceans. You know, we, I, I never heard of marine heat wave 10 years ago. Uh, so same thing with plastic waste. We have produced it, use it for uh, many years it was actually invented for good reason because it's durable. It was actually for good intention. There was actually, uh, I read an article of someone who invented it. He actually had a good intention how we can make a material that is durable. But uh, we just, like climate change, we overdo it. But I, I, to myself, I wouldn't be surprised that there are already plastic in my body. And that's something, it's a price that we pay as society. But can we reverse it? Yes, we have so many good examples in the past how environment, you know, river used to be very dirty. Singapore has very good uh, example for that, how you clean the rivers and you can reverse it. And I, I'm so grateful with plastic. There's so many attention, there's so many awareness, and this is actually something that I, I think it will work. Yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> an important um, learning of, 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 of these days is that um, you know, the world needs to listen to scientists like yourself who are um, providing solutions or providing evidence-based and, and, and objective data. Um, and I think that's um, that's very important too. So with that, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to, to wrap up. I'd like to thank you, Intan, for, for, for these very thoughtful yeah. answers, for the nice conversation, and I hope for an opportunity to have a coffee with you soon. And I'd like to also thank all the, the audience um, for, for, for their questions and for, for listening to us. And with that, I'd like to hand over um, back to the ASM team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Intan and Yannick. Um, we're very grateful that you've both made time to take part in climate conversations and, and bringing about such a pertinent, considered con our discussion today. 
Um, our next talk in the series will be live streamed on the 26th of November. And we're very excited to be joined by photographer and fellow National Geographic explorer, Mandy Barker, whose work is exhibited as part of Planet of Plastic. Um, so Mandy will be speaking about her body of photographic work that draws attention to the marine plastic debris issue and how she has been crowdsourcing the collection from around the world for her artworks and developing this project in collaboration with marine scientists. Mandy will be also sharing her most recent projects, which were created as a result of the Henderson Island Plastic Pollution Expedition. And this session will be hosted and moderated by my colleague, Amita Kirpalani, Curator at Science Museum. On the 5th of December and the 20th of February, the museum will be organizing beach cleanups with seven clean seas. Um, they are an international ocean cleanup organization based in Singapore. They run many programs to combat plastic solution. So if you would like to make a difference, please head over to our Facebook event page to find out more. You can also stay up to date with everything that's happening on site at the museum and on our online content platform, Art Science at Home, via our website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. And finally, a huge thank you to every one of you who's been listening in. We appreciate all your passionate questions and comments throughout the session today. Um, and we hope you do get a chance to visit Planet of Plastic at our Science Museum in Singapore between now and March. Um, please stay safe and be well in the meantime. We hope to see all of you soon. And thank you so much again, Intan and Yannick. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay healthy.